Same with Delia. You know, Delia did a piece for the um, the IEE, which was like a celebration of oh, the... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I remember the dissertation. <laughs> oh, the it, did you write about it, in it? Yeah. Oh, I think so, yeah. <laughs> Remind me. Well, it was, it was this kind of like commemorative concert you know, for like uh, the electrical engineers. Oh, so it, and, I think it was mathematical, it, wasn't it? it? That's yeah. right. Yeah. She was commissioned to do something for it. And um, Brian tells the story of that, which is that she really sort of didn't want it to go out and she purposefully sabotaged it, essentially, so that it couldn't go ahead. She's like just like, lost confidence in it and and brian had took another copy of it and so unbeknownst to her it was played at you know at that event and yeah. you know brian tells the story that she was furious with him she didn't want it to go out and we can be here today and go isn't that wonderful that was done and that was said and we got that piece and of course yes it is but there's also part of you thinks well she didn't want that to go out there and so where's her agency you know in all of this yeah. it's very it's, it's very yeah. tricky well i was just going to say that you know you work closely with the estate mm-hmm. and if, if it's got support and similarly with the paper documents if you put all all that stuff up on the internet you were taking again away the agency from not just posthumously from Delia, but also Clive, her partner, and the people who are still alive who are mentioned in some of those documents. Mm. There's a there's a particular document which was is not part of the original collection that came to Manchester. It was donated later on. So um, the archive has grown. So it's now it's got brilliant collection of material from Delia's childhood. There's a gentleman called Andy Wolf who's living in Delia's childhood home in Coventry, and he found this stash of all her school books and <sighs> her, her gas mask from the Blitz. <sighs> And like some of her Gosh. drawings, you know, that she's doing and some of her school books are, you know, her first writings about music, you know, like who was she listening to? You know, what kind of electronic music could she have been listening to in late 1940s, early 1950s? You know, she's not going to be hearing Verez or, you know, that kind of thing, you know, as being sort of 13, 14, you know, it's not going to be performed in. It, it was, it was in, the air raid sirens that she was inspired by. So yeah. She said, yeah. yeah. And you can hear that on some of her pieces, you know, that, that yeah. you know, that, that kind of like drone uh, is, is definitely haunts her. I I often think that you know she talks about being evacuated to Preston and during the Blitz, and she talks about hearing the sound of like uh, workers' clogs on the cobbled streets, like, oh, yeah. Going, yeah. Going, going to the factories. You know, and if you listen to pieces like Way Out, you'll hear this, um, yeah. you know, like this kind of like little click clock thing. You know, like uh, like Ringo mm. in the back. Yeah, yeah. that's the clogs yeah. on the cobbled street. You know, <laughs> and actually, that's what you get in those school books. Is you know, if she's write like re- like little stories and essays, there's this beautiful. Sp- short story she writes about a music shop like one of these like li- little dusty bric-a-brac type music shop a bit like bag puss like looking through the window you know and there's like <laughs> music mu- music stands and all this kind of stuff in there and then at midnight all the musical instruments come to life including the metronome and the music stand and she writes really evocatively about very the sound. Bag <laughs> it isn't it yeah. it is yeah. but yeah you know like, she writes beautifully about the sound of things so those school books are just gold dust in terms of getting a sense that as as a girl and a young woman, she's absolutely attuned to the sounds all around her, that the world is is full of sonic possibility, which yeah. you can then, you know, and that's what she goes on to do. So, um, yeah, the, the, I'll, I'll tell you, two, the, there's two other stories in there. One is um, a trip to the future or something like that. But basically, it's this story about somebody gets on this train, the commuting home. I think it's the archetypal dark and stormy, win- you know, winter's night. And um, person's on, you know, the, the narrator's on this train and uh, it stops grinds to a halt and the only way i look out the window and they're at this station which they've never seen before and they look at the name of it and they've never heard of it no wonder what you know what it what, what on earth it was and to get back into the carriage and finally get you know gets going again and it pulls in and the narrator goes home and they're reading the newspaper that day and one of the stories in the newspaper is an announcement the commissioning of a new railway station to be built <laughs> and the narrator realizes that they time traveled into the future on this train and they've had a glimpse into mm. 10 20 30. well given that she goes on to do the theme tune for the most famous time yes. travel yeah sure yeah. ever you know the fact that she's already you know, do, yeah. you know doing, doing her own like time travel story so i mean that stuff you know it's wonderful to yeah. have it and, you know she talks about listening to mozart bach beethoven hiding some shostakovich dances uh she mentions those uh we know that she was entering piano competitions in leamington and she like winning awards there and so on so you've got all that yeah. that's brilliant you know that goes in there because that allows you to tell you know a, a bigger story of um you know of, it's of, put in the context music. behind her if we move to uh well, to the current day. Now, there's obviously there's an organisation called Delia Derbyshire Day, which I believe you're a trustee of, uh, which includes acts uh, like Caro C, uh, who we've had on our show. Great new album. Yep. 
Love it. Beautiful album. Yeah, yeah. From what I've heard, yeah. some tracks so far. We we're lucky to play some music on our show. Yeah, Dilly Derbyshire days. When did that start? That's very much Caro again. Caro got in touch around about 2012 just to ask if there was some kind of collaboration that could happen with the archive, which might be to present it to the wider public. So that it kind of grew from that with possibly there would be like commissions of, of work of artists responding to the archive. And then yeah. at the event, there might be a sharing of some of the audio from the archive as well yeah. and some talks about Delia. That was it. So that was very much Caro's initiative. And... She was part of a, a group. They called themselves Delia Darling. Delia Darling. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so the first one was done in 2013 at uh, Band on the Wall in Manchester. And it was just great success. You know, the, I mean, they sold out, you know, the, there was a big queue, like going like right down Holden Road out, uh, outside of Band on the Wall. And, it, it, you know, it, and it was just a lovely thing to do. And so there was the feeling that there was more to go. There was another one in 2014 and that one toured different venues uh, around England. And then Carol discussed with us the possibility of making Delia Derbyshire Day a charitable foundation. And I was at all for it. Delia's estate were absolutely you know, delighted and on board with it. Mark Ayres came on board mm. and uh, Brian Hodgson was one of the founding trustees of it as well. So that got official status in 2015. And the aims of Delia Derbyshire Day now are to, first of all, to basically just grow awareness of mm. Delia's life and her her work but also British electronic music in particular more broadly in that heritage and so we do a lot of outreach work with schools and especially schools that often can't afford music technology software mm. uh, and hardware and Korg have been fantastic at making some of their kit available to a lot of like the schools and family workshops that are going Carol leads on the schools workshops and the re response that you get I think one of the things that is most exciting for me about always has been really with Delia's work and you see it when kids just light up the notion that any object around you mm. can make music and you don't have to pay hundreds of pounds to buy you know whatever instrument it might be with the kind of software that's there now you've got access to that at school or something you can start like you know doing your own sonic invention and there's a wonderful of course I'm sounding like an evangelist here but there's a lovely thing on the um, Delia Dabshire website called the Delia Phonica game, where you can try different techniques that Delia would use. So pitch shift, reverse, filter, changing the speed, ring modulator. And there's like various found sounds that have been put in there, including some of Delia's sounds. And we also invited the public to send sounds in as well. It's an online online app you can use. To it's actually... an online app. Yeah. 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 So any, anybody can play with it and so just like create their own tracks and you can lay a rhythm track down, put like a melody line on top of it and like have a counter melody. So, you know, when you're working with kids who, you know, Delia kind of demolishes traditional understanding of what is a musician who gets to be a musician and that's not to diminish the incredible technique and complexity of what Dee is doing you know you still need to be mm. you know extremely talented to do that but i think the fact that she's from a working class background and a woman from a working class background in the late 1950s and into the 1960s there are so many barriers you're facing there that's inspiring for a lot of people you know a lot of kids to hear that Mm. today yeah. what they often do is that like, they'll create their own pieces at like recordings that they'll make just like everyday objects and uh, they'll get uploaded to soundcloud and in some cases presented back at events and the pride that they've got that they've made something you know and i'm not just saying this but you listen to some of it and i think it's far more interesting as music than a lot of water passes for theme tunes on daytime television <laughs> you know I, yeah. I you know I, I would love to think you know bargain hunt or something like that just let some of these kids loose on it is it so, uh, found sound friday we, we often hear things on the uh, on facebook page together reversing and, and actually with audio visual so got the visual of the, like a loop of a uh, somebody cooking eggs or, or i think i've seen <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's amazing yeah. and it's like i mean for me that like you know i think like archimedes moments when when i was growing up and playing around with sound they were accidents they were things like oh like you know like recording tape off the radio and i remember what i recorded a it was jazz record requests radio three and it was the stan kenton band and there was a power cut at home while i was recording this program and so the cassette player i had it was on battery power so that the, the power went 
uh, Roth the Mains, Bachelor Party, and the Bachelors were really, really shonking, like really poor on this thing. Yeah. And But then midway through, the Mains came back on. And when I listened back to what that sounded like, it was just the most <laughs> wonderful. And it was just one of these like revelatory moments that, you know, like the plastic nature of sound and what like tape, you know, the tape yeah. allows you to play around. And so those moments, I think when you have those discoveries for yourself, yeah. that it's still magic. It's being able to encourage that in, in kids, you know, it's one of the most yeah. rewarding things.